The era of the fruitful incarnation of the Son of God had arrived at the year 1348, when the deadly plague reached the noble city of Florence, of all Italian cities the most excellent. Whether it was owing to the action of the heavenly bodies, or whether, because of our iniquities, it was visited upon us mortals for our correction by the righteous anger of God, this pestilence, which had started some years earlier in the Orient, where it had robbed countless people of their lives, moved without pause from one region to the next until it spread tragically into the West. It was proof against all human providence and remedies, such as the appointment of officials to the task of ridding the city of much refuse, the banning of sick visitors from outside, and a good number of sanitary ordinances. Equally unavailing were the humble petitions offered to the Lord by pious souls not once but countless times, whether in the course of processions or otherwise. As the said year turned to spring, the plague began quite prodigiously to display its harrowing effects. Here it did not develop as it had done in the East, where death was inevitable in anyone whose symptoms were a loss of blood through the nose. Its first sign here, in both men and women, was a swelling in the groin or beneath the armpit, growing sometimes in the shape of a simple apple, sometimes in that of an egg, more or less. A bubo was the name commonly given to such a swelling. Before long, this deadly bubo would begin to spread indifferently from these points to crop up all over. The symptoms would develop then into dark or livid patches that many people found appearing on their arms or thighs or elsewhere. These were large and well separated in some cases, while in others there were a crowd of tiny spots. And just as the buba had been, and continued to be, a sure indication of fatal disease, so were these blotches for those on whom they appeared. No physician's prescriptions, no medicine, seemed of the slightest benefit as a cure for this disease. In addition to those trained in medicine, the number of men and women who claimed to be physicians without having studied the subject at all grew immensely. However, whether it was that the nature of the malady would not permit it, or because doctors were unable to discover its origins and therefore could not apply the proper remedy, not only did few people recover, but indeed nearly all the sick would succumb within three days of the above-mentioned symptoms' first appearance. Some died sooner, some later, and the majority with no fever, nothing. And the plague gathered strength as it was transmitted from the sick to the healthy through normal intercourse, just as fire catches on to any dry or greasy object placed too close to it. Nor did the trouble stop there. Not only did the healthy incur the disease, and with it the prevailing mortality, by talking to or keeping company with the sick. They had only to touch the clothing or anything else that had come into contact with or been used by the sick, and the plague evidently was passed to the one who handled those things. You will be quite amazed by what I am about to tell you. Were it not that many people witnessed it, and I saw it with my own eyes, I would never have dared believe it, still less set it down in writing even if I had had it on the most reliable authority. So potent was the contagion as it was passed on that it was transmitted not only between one person and the next, many a time it quite clearly went further than that, and if some animal other than a human touched an object belonging to a person who was sick or had died of the plague, the animal was not merely infected with it, but fell dead in no time at all. As I have just mentioned, I saw this for myself one day in particular. The rags of a pauper, who had died of the plague, had been tossed out into the street, and two pigs happened upon them. They nosed about them with their snouts, as pigs do, then took them in their jaws and shook them this way and that. It was not long before they fell into convulsions, as if they had swallowed poison, and then dropped dead on top of the rags they had so haplessly snatched up. This sort of thing, as well as many another that was similar to it, if not worse, produced in the survivors all manner of terrors and suspicions, all tending to the same solution, and a very heartless one it was. They would keep their distance from the plague victims, and from their chattels too, thus hoping to preserve their own skins. There were some who inclined to the view that if they followed a temperate lifestyle and eschewed all extravagance, they should be well able to keep such an epidemic at bay. So they would form into a group, and withdraw on their own to closet themselves in a house free of all plague victims. Here they would enjoy the good life, partaking of the daintiest fare and the choicest of wines, 
all in the strictest moderation, and shunning all debauchery.